Well, good morning, everybody. It's a new day. Amen. Amen. That's our theme for the year. And, and today I want to talk about the most glorious new day. Amen. Easter Sunday, wonderful day. But let's just pray before we open the word this morning. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that this is a wonderful day. Lord, every day is a wonderful day, Lord, because you're in every day and you're in our lives. But Lord, this day, Lord, when the world just turns and they celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we are so grateful, so grateful, Lord, that we can celebrate this day, Lord, the day that we can stand and proclaim with a loud voice that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, Lord, that this is a new day. And so, Lord, we just delight in that and we glory in that, Lord, as we open your word, just speak to us, we pray in Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God. Well, just praise God to, for everyone that is here today and just a wonderful day. Uh, as I said, our theme for the year is a new day. And I was saying we, today we're really talking about the most glorious new day. And uh, if you think about Good Friday and then when, when Jesus had been on the cross and then his body was taken to be put in the tomb, and you think about how all the hordes of hell would have been celebrating. They would have all been cheering, having this mass, massive party, thinking that they had conquered uh, Jesus, that they had defeated him and that they had consigned him to the grave. And uh, I was actually talking about celebrating early the other day. We were just reflecting on a, on a, on a cricket match, actually, that uh, Matt, uh, Caleb was in. Uh, it was a, a grand final match, and actually Caleb was a bit of a star, took several catches and played really well in that match. But... Uh, there was a very tense match. They were coming down, only a few runs required and uh, getting very closer and closer. Caleb's team were fielding at the time and Caleb's team got a wicket and the coach was ecstatic. He ran onto the field. He's jumping around, celebrating, pumping the air, running to all the kids, cheering. And, and we're all, all the parents are going, oh no, there's still another wicket to go. We haven't won. And he was just celebrating early. Anyway, the umpire said, excuse me, could you please get off? We're in the middle of a match here. And then the coach is, oh no, he was just put his head down. Anyway, they ended up, did, did get the other wicket and ended up winning the match. But, uh, but the devil thought he'd won a great victory uh, with, with the events of Good Friday and then when Jesus' body was in the tomb. But he didn't know that, that what Jesus has planned, what God had already ordained right from the beginning, uh, that Jesus would rise again from the dead. I just want to read this little passage from John uh, chapter 20. It's about the Easter morn, about the most glorious new day. And so let's just have a look at this together. I'm reading from John chapter 20 and verses from 1 to 18. If you've got a Bible, you can follow it. Otherwise, you can follow it up there on the screen. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Mandolin went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outrun Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over, looked into the strips looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. And you can just imagine that. You know, John would stop there and he's looking there. Simon Peter, just typical Peter, comes running, bumbling in, crashing straight into the tomb and he's looking over. And then Simon Peter came along. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who was John, who reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. There's something interesting, isn't it? He saw and he believed. They still don't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. The disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary, this is Mary Mandolin, who had already come and told them. Mary stood outside the tomb crying and she wept. She bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realise that it was Jesus. He asked the woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, let me, let, tell me where you put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Robini, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Don't hold on to me, 
for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell him, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Mandolin went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them uh, that he'd said these things to her. What, what a glorious day. When, when they'd come and, and, and already the disciples are already in brokenness and despair, wondering what on earth is going on. And on this glorious morning, Mary goes to the tomb and then the tomb is empty. The stone has been rolled away, the angel's there, the gardener was actually Jesus. And, uh, and she suddenly realised that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. And really the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most pivotal event in all of Christendom. Obviously, Jesus had to be born and come down, Christ came down. God came down in flesh and lived and dwelt among us. So yes, we needed Christmas Day without Christmas. There was never Easter, but the whole point of Christmas was Easter, that Jesus would come and, and die on the cross in our place for our sin. And I, and I trust that on this most glorious day, that the thing that resonates in all of our hearts is the words that, uh, that, that uh, Mary cries out. She says, I have seen the Lord. And that's the most important thing for each of us on Easter Sunday, when everyone else could be running around uh, wondering about eggs and hot cross buns, or they can get hot cross buns anytime now, can't you? They're all year round, or they're worried about their Easter eggs and worried about lunches and all different things that we focus on, that, that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. And that tomb is empty, amen? His body wasn't there because he had risen from the dead. Now, the main verse that I want to, want to focus on is in Colossians chapter 2 and verses 13 to 15. Because I do want to talk a little bit about the cross because, yes, Easter Sunday is all about the resurrection. But again, there's no resurrection if there was no cross and if there was no death. So I do want to talk about that just for a little moment, looking at Colossians chapter 2 and verses 13 to 15. And this is what it says. When you were dead in your sins, and that's you... And that's me, that's each and every one of us. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. Because we know that Jesus, on the third day that he rose again, he miraculously rose again. And we know that is a historical fact. We, we know that even uh, contemporary uh, writers such as Tacticus, the, 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 the Roman guy, the Josephus, the Jewish historian, others had, had testified to the fact that, that it was well known that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. In fact, we know that uh, with, with the, the, the soldiers that were guarding the tomb, uh, that there was their life. If they let anyone near that tomb, then they would, would, would die for it. Well, eventually those guards did because they couldn't explain why this tomb was empty. And so they were all actually uh, eventually executed. And so this miraculous event where the angel had rolled away the tombstone, Jesus had risen from the dead. And it says, God made you alive with Christ. And he would have seen on that clip that when Jesus rose from the dead and that when we give our life to Christ, when he makes us alive, our spirit which is dead because of sin, and I want to talk a little bit about sin in a moment, our spirit which is dead becomes alive in Jesus Christ. And it says that uh, God made you alive with Christ. We become alive with him. Baptism is such a beautiful picture because it really is a wonderful picture of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and our participation in it. That, that when we're baptised, we, it's like we go down into the tomb, if you like, as we go into the water, all the sin and junk of our life is left behind. And as we come up, we're raised to a new life, even as Jesus was raised up and, and to the glory of the Father. So when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. We are alive. We are spiritually alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins. I'll talk about that for a moment. Having cancelled the charge of legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. What an amazing image and picture that is, that the risen Christ, having disarmed the, the, the cohorts, the demons of hell, the devil, and that he made a public spectacle of them. He humiliated them. They thought they were having this great party. They were celebrating that Jesus Christ rose in victory and totally humiliated every work of the enemy, laying it low, triumphing over them by the cross. 
But it says, he forgave us all our sins. And it's interesting that we live in a society and a culture where forgiveness is something that is becoming increasingly rare for people to forgive. And uh, it, it's amazing how people will hold on to things, that they hold on to things in our society. That if somebody, somebody does, you can do 10,000 good things. You do one bad thing, and, and might not even be a bad thing, be perceived to be a bad thing by a different value system that is actually not even a godly one, uh, that, that, that people will not forgive you. They will hold that against you. You can make one mistake and, 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 and people will hold you accountable for that for the rest of your life. And it's, it's, it's actually a horrible culture that we're actually uh, having developing even more and more in the Western culture, at least, where this whole thing of, of holding people to account, not forgiving them. But we, we praise God that, that Christ is not like that. It's, it says here that in verse 14, he cancelled the charge of legal indebt indebtedness which stood against us. It's interesting, when Jesus was on the cross, when he was hanging on the cross, there was actually on the top of the cross there was the charge for his crime. Because when the Romans, when they put someone on the cross, whatever they were guilty of, their, 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 their crime was actually put there with them, whether they were guilty of insurrection, whether they were guilty of murdering, robbing, whatever it was, and then, then that charge would be against them. Well, Jesus, when he was on the cross, you don't often see that depicted when you look at all the movies and different things. But when Jesus on the cross, his charge was also put there on the top of the cross against him. Jesus's crime, you know what Jesus's crime was? He was the king of the Jews. And that was written there. It was written there in Greek. It was written there in Aramaic. It was written there in Latin, three different languages with the charge here at Jesus, the king of the Jews, the king of the Jews. And that was his crime that he was the king of the Jews and, and that was why he was on the cross. Now, the thing about Jesus, of course, is that he never committed any sin in his entire life. He was perfect. He was fully man. He was fully God. He lived a total sinless life. And he was put on the cross for the charge of being the king of the Jews. Well, the reality is Jesus is the king of the Jews. He is the king of the Gentiles. He's the king of the world. He's the king of every heart. He's the king of the whole earth. He's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. He's the king of all things. And so the only charge that they could put up on Jesus Christ when they had him up on the cross is, was true. It's who he was. He was the king. He was the king of kings. And he is the Lord of lords, not just the king of the Jews. That was the crime that he committed. And so he went to the cross and so it wasn't because of what his sin that put him there. It was our sin was there. And it says here that he cancelled the charge of legal indebtedness. Now just imagine for each and every one of us, because every one of us should have died on a cross. Every one of us deserves it. I don't care you tell me how good you are, how wonderful you are. You look at God's standard of perfection. You could not be further away. And the scripture says, it says, all have fallen short. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone. So realistically, if there was a cross and a cross was put there and this was going to be your cross. Now, praise God, we don't have to go to the cross because Jesus went to the cross in our place. But if he didn't, then there would be our own cross that would be there ready for us to be upon that cross. And upon that cross would be the legal charge of what we're guilty of, the sin that we're all the things that every one of us is guilty of. Now, if you begin to think of some of those sins and those things were written down, they was listed down. And, and rather than just on a little wooden thing up the top uh, that said, King of the Jews, just imagine what your plaque would be. Just imagine how big it would be. It would, it would probably start off and all of the things that you've done, all the things that you're guilty of, and this thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so there's this cross which you're going to be up there. But all of your sin and all of your indebtedness, they try to put that on the cross. Bang! I think the cross would probably just fall over the weight of just your sin uh, and my sin if, if we were in that position. And when Jesus Christ, he, he, when he went to the cross, and so rather than us having all our sin uh, put upon us, all of that was actually put upon him. The charges that every one of us are guilty of, the sin that every one of us has committed that separates us from God, who is a holy God and a perfect God, and, and, and sin is the thing that separates us. But it says here that he cancelled the charge of legal indebtedness. 
And so we don't actually go to the cross. And even if they made a cross for you and put a cross there, it would just have not guilty over it because Jesus Christ went to the cross in our place. He took the sin that every single one of us deserve and he took that upon himself. He said he cancelled the charge of legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. But see, because of Jesus Christ, because of the cross, there's nothing to condemn you. There's no charge against you. Jesus has cancelled that you are not guilty and never let the devil come to you and try to say, oh, but what about, uh, nah, nah. no, he's got nothing to say. Jesus did a finished work on the cross. He's cancelled it. It's gone in Jesus' name. And talking about cancelling, again, part of our culture, we have a society where there is a cancel culture. That if you do something wrong, and, and people have said things 10 years ago on social media, and what will happen is that someone will dig up what you said 10 years ago, and again, it might not align with, align with their value system, which usually is crooked because it's the worldly value system anyway. If you've said something that in somehow someone could perceive as being offensive, and it might have even been, what will happen is now is that not only, do, first of all, that they will bring that up and they will shove that in your face, but not only your face, that sin that you did or perceived sin, whatever it was, is paraded across the whole face of the earth. It'll be on all over social media. It'll probably end up in the newspapers. And <gasps> 10 years ago, you said da 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 and it's put there. And what happens is a society now will then try to cancel you. Now, I think of that author, um, what's her name, Rowling's, now, she made a comment, which is actually a sensible comment. So somebody said, oh, they should come up with a phrase for women who have a monthly cycle. And uh, she said, well, yeah, there is. It's women. Now, she made that simple little comment and immediately they started pulling all... Now, I don't like her books anyway, but that's not the point. They started pulling all her books off shelves and just tried to cancel her because of something she said. Because in a worldly value system... What she said didn't align with that. And so they will try to cancel. And people, at this cancel culture that we have, if you disagree with me or if I do anything you say, then not only do I am going to stand against what you said, I'm going to actually make you cease to exist. That you're going to lose your job. You're going to lose all these things, this cancel culture that we're in. But I praise God is that the, the, the culture, the cancel culture of Jesus is not one where he shoves up something you did 10, 20, 30 years ago and shoves it in your face. What he does, he actually cancels that sin. And rather than cancelling you, he actually gives you life. He gives you a new beginning, a new hope, a new start. And that's the joy of Easter, that he cancels all of the sin. He, all of that stuff is cancelled. And you, you stand before the Lord holy and radiant because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And then the wonderful thing about the cross of Christ is that you have incredible freedom now because of that. We have salvation. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, his death was such an important thing because it did it. It cancelled that thing that every one of us stood guilty of. But now, when you give your life to Christ, there's nothing, no accusation not guilty. You're perfect. You're blameless. Now others might say, hang on, back in Facebook, back in da, da, da. No, no, no. Before God, you are holy and you are blameless. And he's the only one you have to please is pleasing him. He's the only one that we want to live our life for to give glory is unto him. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I praise God for what he did. He forgave us all our sins, all of them, every one of them, not all of them, but that one, all of them, all of our sins. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of legal indebtedness, which stood against and condemned us, having taken it away, nailing it to the cross. So he bore that. And I love this part, verse 15. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them over the cross. Because what the world will try to do if you make a mistake, they'll try to humiliate you. They will put it up there. They'll underline it. They'll highlight it. They'll keep talking about whatever that was. But what Jesus did is that the very work of the enemy, the one who was celebrating early, who thought that he won this victory, when Jesus rose from the dead, he totally humiliated the enemy. 
humiliated. It's talking about a triumph. That's a Roman triumph is what it's referring to, is where the conquering general would return and the whole city would turn out. They would build them a triumphal arch and then they would come through and, and with a general and all the people, all the accolades of the people and behind them would be the defeated enemy with their heads bowed low and uh, probably stripped bare and just being trialed along by chains behind them, behind the victorious general. And this is the image of what the Lord accomplished when he rose again from the dead, from his victory, that he has made an open show of the enemy. Now, some people live their lives in fear of the devil. Oh, the devil this, the devil that. Just remember that you have a humiliated enemy. Don't glorify a humiliated enemy. Christ humiliated him on the cross. He made an open show and there's so much power in the name of Jesus Christ. We have victory in the name of Jesus Christ. We don't fear the work of the enemy because of the cross of Jesus Christ, because of the empty tomb, because of his resurrection. And we have complete power and authority in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I trust you believe that. Never let him intimidate you. Whenever you see the enemy trying to come back and say, oh, Facebook 10 years ago, or whatever, trying to remind you of sin or trying to bring you down, you just think of the image straight away. Hang on a minute. Jesus is on the cross. He took all my sins. So you got nothing to say to me, boy. It's all done. Jesus rose again from the dead. And what did he do? He actually humiliated him, bringing him down in his train as his captives and train in shame as he's glorying in this possession of victory and the defeat of the enemy. Just don't let him remind him, hang on, you're defeated by Jesus Christ. You've got nothing to say to me because I've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. The, 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 the charges are all clear. I've got a clean rap sheet. Everything's clean. Nothing there. You've got nothing to say to me. And in fact, you've been humiliated. So devil, get away from me. You defeated foe. You be gone in Jesus' name. Don't let him intimidate you. Don't let him bring you down. Don't let him try to dredge up your past and say, condemn you with your sin of something that happened before. Because you'll try to do that. Because he's humiliated. He'll try to humiliate you. He's defeated. He's going to try to defeat you. He's been brought low. He'll try to bring you low as well. Don't listen to him. Don't buy into it. Don't let the devil try to bring you down. Just remember who he is and who Jesus is. The devil is the defeated foe. He's the footstool. He's under our feet. And Jesus Christ, who won that victory on the cross, who rose again from the dead, he is victorious. He's the one who we serve. He's the one that we follow. He's the one that we've surrendered our life to. And so we can live a full, gracious life because of the work of the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, rendered them powerless, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And I just love that verse. And I want you to love that verse, love that scripture. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of the flesh, God made you alive with Christ. What it is to be alive. What a horrible thing it is to be dead. And people live their whole lives fearful of death, fearful of the devil. And their life is empty and drudgery because they don't know the life of Christ. The one who forgave our sins, cancelled that charge, and that he's taken it away and disarmed the enemy. I just love that passage. That's in Colossians 2, 13 to 15. And so just remember that, that, that we live in a new day because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That that tomb was empty. That when Mary went to the tomb and she was in despair, and yet Jesus had risen from the dead. And uh, in, the, in another passage, the angel says, Why do you look for the living among the dead? So many people spend a lot of their life looking for life amongst dead things and they never find it. All they find is emptiness and heartbreak and brokenness. Don't look for the living among the dead. Look for the living Christ who has risen. He has risen from the dead. And there's another beautiful passage in, in also in, in Colossians. It's quite a, a great book in the, in the Bible. Colossians chapter 3 in, in verses um, 1 to 4. I'll just have a look at this. So because we know now, we know that, that Jesus died on the cross, rather than all our sin being upon us, he took all those charges, and so we have been made not guilty. We're blameless before God because of Jesus Christ, because he's risen again from the dead and, and has made a, a spectacle over the enemy. He was celebrating. He said, no, no, victory is mine because he reigned supreme. He reigned supreme. But Colossians 3 verses 1 to 2, it tells us this then, in light of that, it says, since then... 
you have been raised with Christ. So, we're, we're, And that's the thing about being born again. When Christ ra- came up victorious, having defeated sin and death, we live a life of victory because of Jesus Christ. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. And because of that, what should we do? How should we live our life in response to Good Friday and Easter Sunday? What should we do about that? How should we live our lives? It says, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your hearts. Set your hearts. Have you got your heart set on something? Have you ever had your heart set on something? I'm sure you have. Some people have their heart set on little trivial things. I'm looking forward to those hot cross buns. I have my heart set on hot cross buns. Better have some hot cross buns today. I had my heart set on it. Well, that's not really. That's just a little flippant little desire. But enjoy your hot cross buns anyway. You're welcome to. But if you've got your heart really set on something, like getting married or something, for example, like it's something that totally will begin to consume you, doesn't it? It takes all of your affection. And really, that's the meaning of the word there. When it says, set your hearts on things, it's saying, uh, it means to seek after, to strive after. It's basically taking all our affection. And so in view of what Christ has done for us on the cross, that he died and yes, he rose again victoriously. That is people that we set our affections on it. That is the thing that motivates us. That is the thing that becomes the passion of our life, not the accumulation of stuff, not the accolades of men, what people say, but because of Jesus Christ, our hearts are just set to him. We just want to love the Lord. We just want to honor him. We want to bring him glory with every part of our heart, with every part of our life. Because of this, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He sits in a place of triumphal victory. Amen. He sits and rules with power and authority. At the name of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow. He has full power, full dominion, seated at the right hand of the Father. And so it tells us to set our affections, that the things that motivate you, the things that stir your heart, that create passion in your life, are the things of God, that, that they're the things that motivate you. And that's why we're different for other people. When you give your life to Christ, you're not the same as other people in the world. They've got other, another value system. They've got other ways, as I've mentioned before, about they try to rank people according to their view of success and different things in the world. But it's the people of God, our heart is pleasing God and our affections upon him. So it says, since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. And then in verse 2, it says, set your minds on things above not on earthly things. And so one is thinking about our affections, what motivates us, what is our passion, what drives us, what gets you out of bed in the morning, what causes you to do what you do, what is that thing? Well, for us, we set our hearts on the things above. But then it also says about setting your minds on things above. And here we look at the word mind there. It means you direct your mind to one thing. You're thinking about the thing. It's the thing that captivates your attention. So our heart is with God. He captivates our affection. He motivates us. He gives us passion in our lives. But then our thoughts are about him. I tell you what, there's so many things in this life can then bombard our minds and fill our thoughts with all sorts of stuff. And, And the world will try to do that because... The more hysteria, the more fear, the more issues, the more problems, the more newspapers that were sold, there'll be more people clicking on the Facebook posts, more doing all of this. And so many things are constantly competing to your attention all of the time. If you've got a phone, you get little alerts, bing, 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 bing. Your phone's just going off. So, you know, if you're smart, you actually just keep, you just silence all the alerts, actually. But anyway, but... Everything's trying to grab your attention all the time, isn't it? Everything in the world is trying to grab your attention. And not everything in the world is good that's trying to grab our attention. And so we have to be disciplined in our mind and set our mind. And so every day, that's why it's important that you reorientate yourself, that you spend time in prayer and that you get into, we, we look at the Word of God and we have our mind set on the things of God. And so right from, I've charted the course of my day. My mind is set on the things of God. Now the world are going to throw a lot of stuff at me. The world are going to try to get my attention in many different ways. But no, because I've been raised again with Christ, because of Easter, 
My affection, my passion, my motivation is the Lord, but my intention my, my, uh, is given unto the Lord. And so we consciously say, no, Lord, this day I want to live my life to glorify you. This day, Lord, I want to lift you up. This day, Lord, let me be an example. This day, let your light shine through me. Lord, this day, give me an opportunity to, to speak your word of life and to impart into someone. And so because of this, there's that encouragement to live in such a way. And it says, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. This is verse three. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And so we don't live like everyone else now. We've got a new life. Our life is in Christ now. We live in Christ because of the wonder of the cross and the glory of the resurrection. Our life is in Christ. And it says in verse four, when Christ appears, who is your life? You know, well, just, you know, you've seen those shows where they say, this is your life. And they go there, here we are, this is me, you know, sucking my thumb and doing all these things and growing up all the things they ever did on this life. But really for Christians, when, when, when someone would say, this is your life, for us, what is it? It should be Christ. Christ, Christ is our life. He is the one who defines us. He's the one who gives us our identity. He's the one that gives us our destiny. He's the one that shapes us and molds us and, and works within our life. Our life is Christ. This is your life. It's Jesus and, and a wonderful life it is when we give our life to Christ. It says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. See, because of the cross, uh, we, 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 all the sin and all the charges, the guilty that we're all, all that's been taken away. Jesus rose again from the dead and for a new life. And we live this wonderful new life, the glory of the new day every day with, with, with Jesus Christ. But also, and so that means that our, our affection, our motivation, our passion comes through Jesus Christ. Our attention, what, how we direct and live our life, the decisions and the choices that we make are kingdom orientated. They're Christ orientated, the things that we think about. But also the way that we live our life, there's this incredible anticipation because it says here, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Because four, main, four, four, four big events. One is Jesus coming down, the word becoming flesh. We have Christmas Day. Praise God for Christmas Day. We have the cross. We have Good Friday, which is an amazing Thing in juncture in all of eternity when, when, when our sin was dealt with, when there's that reconciling to God for all of us who receive and, and give our life to Christ. And then there's the glory of the resurrection that we're raised for a new life. And that new life, by the way, is now. It's now you're living that new life. Now you have that. And let Christ, excuse me, be your life. But then the other, the climax of the age, if you like, is when Jesus Christ is going to return and he's coming back. And so we live with our, uh, with our uh, affection, with our attention direct, um, directed to Christ, but the anticipation of Christ's return. And, and we've got to live like that's, that could be tomorrow. And it could be. It could be. What if it was tomorrow? What would you do now if, if I told you that Jesus is coming tomorrow? Now, if I told you that, I'm a nutcase because no one knows that, all right? But the scripture says, look at the signs, look, look at the, the times. And, and every generation, right from the early birth of the church until now, every generation had to live with the expectation that Jesus is coming. Because he's coming at a time when no one knows and no one expects that. But, but what if he was coming tomorrow? What if he was? What would you do different today? Would you just go home, kick back, have a little snooze, you know, have, have, eat some Easter eggs? Just feel bloated and then lie back, have a snooze. Or would you do something different? Jesus was coming tomorrow. What would you do? What would you do, really? What would you do if Jesus was coming tomorrow? You'd probably, all, all your loved ones who don't know Christ, you'd say, you, you better um, get ready, guys, because Jesus is coming. Because if we don't know Christ, if we haven't surrendered for him, then, then when we do have a cross, which is bloated with all our sin. And there is a, is a punishment because the charge sheet is still valid and then therefore we'd have to face that. And so it would certainly change the way that we live our lives if we knew Jesus was coming tomorrow. We don't know when he's coming back. It could be any moment at any time and yet it should shape our lives, the anticipation of Christ's return. When you're going through stuff, and we've been through a lot of stuff the last 
year and a bit, however long, but really we go through stuff all the time. And when you go through stuff, if you're living with the anticipation of Christ's return, you think, yeah, that was bad, but Jesus is coming back. Yeah, that, that's bad, but Jesus is coming. And we're going to live with him forever, forever for eternity. That's a really long time. Did you know that? It's outside of time. It's forever. And so even as Peter talks about my light and momentary troubles, even though you might feel this is killing you at the time, in the context of eternity, it's really not such a big deal. It's really not such a big deal. But yeah, but it... But in the context of eternity, it's really not such a big deal. And so we as a people, because of the cross and because of the resurrection, we live in the anticipation of Christ's return because he is coming back. And the scripture says that he'll come back and all of those, all those all followers, those who follow him are going to be caught up in the air. It's about the dead in Christ being caught up first. And then the rest of us, we will go be with them. And then we have the millennial reign of Christ. And then we have the, the judgment books open. All those who, were, who weren't written in the Lamb's Book of Life, all those who didn't make the transaction, who didn't let Jesus die in their place, but decided to take that themselves and bear their own punishment, and then that, that's the final event, uh, the climatic time in history. And so we'd live our life differently. And I encourage every one of us, let's live every day knowing that Jesus is coming back. And it might be tomorrow. It might be in, might be in a minute. No, I don't know. It could be. It could be any time. So let's live our lives with that expectation when Jesus Christ is returning. And just an encouragement to anyone here that if you're here today, or if you're watching there, that if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, then can I encourage you to do that? That Easter is, is about something. And it's something extraordinary, the most glorious day when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And I encourage you, give your life to Jesus Christ. Surrender for him. Don't, don't try to carry the weight of your own sin because it's just going to bury you, not only in life now, It'll bury you forever. So come to Jesus. Give your life to him. Say, Lord, I've, I've sinned. And yes, I, I, know I, I know I deserve punishment. I haven't met your perfection, your standard of perfection, Lord. I, I haven't done that. I've done things in my life. And so, Lord, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Lord, forgive me of my sin. Lord, I don't want that rubbish in my life. Lord, I want your holiness. I want your righteousness. And then as you make that transaction, then your sin gets planted upon Jesus Christ. And then in exchange for that, he gives you the glory and wonder of his life. And then the power of the resurrection is unlocked in your own life. And the promise of eternal life becomes your reality. So I encourage you to do that. If you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you're here today. I'd love to pray with you. I'll just wait over there. You can come and I'll pray with you. If you're watching online, just go to our website. Go to the Find Jesus section there. And it'll tell you how to give your life to Christ and how to be connected. connected. But let's pray. Let's stand together and pray as we remember the most glorious day when Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. Amen? Amen? And let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for this day. Lord, we just are in awe of the sacrifice of the cross, Lord, that you would, that Jesus would die in our place for our sin, that would take the punishment that we deserved. And we are so grateful that you died in our place, Lord Jesus, for our sin. But Lord, we are so glad that you rose again from the dead because that affirmed that what you said is who you were and what you did actually had meaning because you rose again from the dead, that you defeated sin, you defeated death and that you made a spectacle over every work of the enemy. You laid the enemy low and Father, we thank you that we live a victorious life in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the promise of your return, Lord. We're looking forward to when you come back. But this day, Lord, we just want to thank you so much Thank you, Lord, that that tomb was empty, that when Mary went there, the tomb was empty. When Peter and John went there, the tomb was empty because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Bless you. Praise God.